Welcome to our introduction to servers. If you're new to the world of professional IT, are thinking of buying your first server, or simply want to find out what makes servers different from desktop PCs, then you're in the right place. Without servers, the world as we know it would cease to exist. Credit cards, e-commerce, watching this video on YouTube, and basically the internet itself couldn't function. But what exactly is a server and why is it so important to make the right choices when buying one? At its most basic level, a server is a computer, but unlike desktop PCs or laptops, servers aren't used by individuals. In fact, most servers are only very occasionally connected to a keyboard, mouse and monitor and are normally remotely managed over a network. Servers are used in this different way because they act as hosts for communal services such as email, web services, databases and accounting packages to name just a few examples. The other vital role servers play is to connect all the desktop PCs and laptops in your organisation together so that they can all share access to the same data. Up until the early 2000s, a separate server would be required for each of these tasks. But the advent of virtualization means many tasks can be performed independently from one another on a single server, running multiple virtual machines. This process of virtualization makes more efficient use of the hardware, as many server tasks only put demand on the hardware sporadically, rather than having multiple separate servers which only occasionally run at full capacity. Virtual machines are generally easier to manage too, as additional instances can be quickly spun up as your business needs change. The very different use cases for desktop PCs and servers, and the fact that most servers need to be operational 24-7, 365 days of the year, means that servers have very different hardware and software, something that we'll explore in the rest of this video. The most immediately obvious difference between servers and desktops is their form factor. Whilst desktop PCs can be quite bulky and are typically positioned under or on top of desks, the vast majority of servers are long and thin and slot into 19-inch racks. The reason for this is so that multiple servers can be easily stacked together in a single cabinet, along with other IT infrastructure devices such as network switches, UPSs and NASes. The 19 inch refers to the width of the server or device so that you can mix and match different items together in one cabinet, even from different brands. The only thing you really need to pay attention to is the height of the server, which is expressed as a number, typically one, two or four, and the letter U, which stands for units. Larger servers, those with more U's, are typically chosen because they support more HDDs or SSDs or because you need more processing power in the form of additional CPUs and GPUs. All that said, you do see a few desktop style servers and these tend to be a bit taller than typical desktop PCs and are known as tower servers. Whilst tower servers don't support as many drives, CPUs and GPUs as rack servers, they are a popular choice for small businesses which don't have a rack cabinet or a server room. Whatever the form factor of a server, another key area of difference from desktop PCs is the CPU, or in most cases, CPUs. AMD and Intel both make server CPUs known as Epic and Xeon Scalable respectively. And for both brands, these are very different beasts to their desktop equivalents. The most important differences, whichever brand you're looking at, are that server CPUs have many more cores than desktop CPUs. How many more? Well, desktop CPUs max out at 16 cores, but server CPUs provide as many as 64 cores. And this allows servers to run many more applications and tasks in parallel than desktop PCs. Server CPUs also support much more RAM, typically around 4096 gigabytes compared to just 128 gigabytes for desktop CPUs. And this is critical as most server workloads are very RAM hungry, especially if you're planning on running multiple virtual machines. There are some special server CPUs that support even more memory for specialized applications. Another key difference is that server CPUs support more PCIe lanes than desktop CPUs, which is important as the server can support additional devices such as NICs, RAID controllers and NVMe SSDs. The other big area of difference between server and desktop CPUs is scalability. Desktop PCs only ever have a single CPU, but the vast majority of servers have or at least can support two CPUs. 
adding a second CPU to a server provides more cores and more memory, boosting individual application performance and allowing more applications to run in parallel. And finally, it's worth noting that unlike desktop CPUs, which are designed for short bursts of activity a few hours of a day, server CPUs are engineered for the 24-7, 365 operation that servers demand. We've already talked about how servers can support a lot more RAM than desktop PCs, but the type of RAM is different too. And this is because servers support an advanced memory technology called ECC, which stands for Error Correction Code. ECC checks and corrects any memory errors on the fly, protecting your applications from data loss or crashing. And it's also worth noting that servers support more memory channels than desktop PCs. For example, whilst most desktop PCs support dual channel memory, servers support as many as eight channels. And having more channels provides more memory bandwidth to the CPU, boosting performance. However, it's not strictly necessary to install server memory in multiples of eight, it's just advisable. Just like many desktop PCs, all servers include a basic integrated GPU to drive the operating system on the rare occasion a monitor is connected. In addition, some servers have the capability to support discrete GPUs for specialist workloads such as rendering, AI and high performance computing. Typically, these are PCIe cards, although there's a special type of GPU packaging known as SXM, which embeds multiple GPUs and their memory onto a high-density PCB that looks more like a motherboard than a graphics card. Like server CPUs, server GPUs are very different from their desktop counterparts, with specific architecture that enhance performance, support for ECC memory and virtualization capabilities, and they're also built to operate 24-7, 365. Unlike desktop GPUs, which are designed for short periods of activity a few hours a day. To this end, server GPUs are passively cooled, relying on cool air passing over their large heat sinks from the case fans. In the segment on form factor, we've already touched on how servers can support more drives than desktop PCs. Another key difference is that the drive bays in most servers are hot swappable, allowing you to remove and replace failed drives without losing any uptime. If the drives are configured in the right sort of RAID, whether the drives are slow HDDs, mid-speed SATA or SAS SSDs, or super-fast NVMe SSDs is in some way immaterial. What matters is that without the right drives configured in the right way, a server is no good to anyone. After all, a server's primary role is to serve data to applications and users on your network. The primary thing to get right is making sure that your server natively supports the type, number and configuration of drives that you want or has the capability to add in a RAID or HBA controller to enable the server to do so. This is all the more important if you're planning some sort of failover servers or software-defined storage. And it's also worth noting that server drives come in a much wider variety than those for desktop PCs, which tend to, but are not limited, to 2.5-inch and 3.5-inch SATA and SAS HDDs, 2.5-inch SATA and SAS SSDs, plus NVMe SSDs, which come in a variety of form factors such as M.2 for boot drives, plus U.2, U.3 and E1.S for data drives. And finally, there are good old-fashioned tape drives for archiving. The NICs or network cards in a server also have a critical role to play in enabling other devices on the network to communicate effectively with the server. Unlike desktop PCs and laptops, which often use low-speed wired connections such as 1 or 2.5 gigabits Ethernet or Wi-Fi, servers always use wired connections. And this is because wired networks are faster, they're more reliable and they're more secure than Wi-Fi. In smaller organizations, a 10 gigabit Ethernet connection is normally sufficient, with faster 25, 40, 50, 100, 200 and 400 gigabit speeds being available for larger networks and more demanding applications. Alternatively, some networks use the InfiniBand standard. Whilst this is very rare on business networks, it's a popular choice for HPC and AI workloads, offering similar speeds to Ethernet of up to 400 gigabits per second. Regardless of what speed the NICs are, you can always add more ports for additional performance. And these extra ports can also be configured to take over in case one fails, ensuring the server can still communicate with the network. 
A new type of enhanced NIC has also started to appear in the market recently. DPUs or data processing units offload work from the CPU, enabling a much faster communication, especially when used in a software-defined storage configuration. Most servers also include a dedicated 1 gigabit Ethernet port that's reserved for the remote management interface and doesn't carry normal data. This allows system administrators to perform maintenance such as software and firmware updates, reboots and re-image drives all without having to go anywhere near the server. To help guide you through picking the right server components, we've actually produced some really helpful dedicated videos on server GPUs, CPUs, storage, networking and RAM. So we will add links to those in the video description for you. Unlike desktop PCs, which typically only have a single add-in card, such as GPU, most servers are bristling with cards, such as NICs, RAID controllers, and HBAs. Just like desktop PCs, these are normally 1x, 4x, 8x, or 16x PCIe cards, either low profile or full height, so you need to make sure that the card and server are compatible with one another. Most low profile PCIe cards are supplied with a full height bracket for installing in more spacious servers. Many servers also have another choice of card available, OCP cards. The Open Compute Project is an organization that shares designs of data center products and best practices amongst companies in an attempt to promote standardization and improve interoperability. The OCP is supported by large networking manufacturers including NVIDIA, Cisco and Dell, the result being standard OCP form factor adding cards that plug into special OCP slots and are more compact than PCIe cards. OCP 3.0 is the latest version. Servers also have very different PSUs or power supplies from desktop PCs. Desktop PCs use boxy ATX, micro ATX or SFX power supplies that are fixed into the case with screws. In contrast, server power supplies slot into the back servers and can be removed and replaced in case of failure. A process known as hot swapping without shutting down the server. Most servers have what's called a 1 plus 1 configuration, which means that it has two PSUs, each with its own mains cable, the first being used in normal conditions with the second PSU ready and waiting in standby in case the first PSU fails. You'll also see some servers, such as those with multiple GPUs with even more PSUs, normally described as 2 plus 1 or even 3 plus 1, etc. In these examples, the server needs at least two or three PSUs to operate, with a hot spare waiting to take over in case one of the primary PSUs fail. Regardless of the configuration, the hot swappable nature of server PSUs means they don't have any cables. Instead, server PSUs plug into a PCB inside the case that has the cables on the other side. The final area of difference between desktop PCs and servers that it's worth being aware of is how they're cooled. Whilst most servers use the same combination of heat sink and fans as desktop PCs, the compact and densely packed nature of rack mount servers means that the fans in servers need to be much more powerful to push air through the case and as a result are extremely loud. Now this shouldn't be an issue for larger organisations which have an air conditioned server room that people only ever enter to perform maintenance, but it is worth bearing in mind if you have a small office and were planning on installing a server in an open plan area. It's also worth noting that just like PSUs, the fans in servers are normally hot swappable, so they can be removed and replaced in case of failure without shutting down the server. Now that we've covered all the big differences between desktop PCs and servers and how the latter are specially engineered for delivering reliable performance across networks, it's also worth touching on the differences in software. The most notable difference is that there are specific Microsoft and Linux operating systems for servers. For example, whilst Windows Server has a similar look and feel to Windows Home or Pro, it's got many more security options and supports lots of server-specific features such as virtual machines, file serving, 
Active Directory and an email server to name just a few. However, Linux is far more popular on servers than it is on desktop PCs, especially for the most demanding workloads such as AI and high performance computing. Again, we'll add a link to a dedicated video for server software to help you understand the differences and choose the right one for your needs. So there you have it. You now have a good grasp of what a server is and how they differ from standard desktop PCs. I do hope that you found this video useful. If you have any questions at all or any feedback, then make sure that you pop them in the comments section below and our server experts will reply to you when they can.